This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream, unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and non-fiction series. And for you guys, use the promo code GEOGRAPHICS when prompted during sign up and you'll get 30 days for free. More on them in a bit. Layer upon layer of mudstone, marble, and asphalt, of dreams, sweat, blood, and time. Sedimented and amalgamated over the course of centuries, they have built the city eternal. This is Rome, once capital of a mighty empire and the seat of papal power. A city such as this has an endless stream of stories and histories to offer. Some are well known, but many more are mysterious, yet hiding in plain sight. In today's geographics, we're going to explore one of the layers that made the city, a layer unseen to the naked eye and sprawling beneath the surface. I'm talking about the catacombs, the long underground galleries into which the early and Christian community of Rome buried its dead. Rome, as we all know, wasn't built in a day, although according to legend, its perimeter and foundations were laid down pretty quickly by twin brothers Romulus and Remus, adopted sons of the She-Wolf. Just like the mythical founders, I shall start our journey from the foundation. First things first, how do you pronounce the word catacombs? The American way, which is not how I would pronounce it, is catacombs, while the British would say catacombs. Now, neither pronunciation is incorrect, though the British pronunciation is more respectful to the original etymology of the term, as you will hear later in this video. The next question is, what exactly are catacombs? Popular culture and traditional depictions of Paleo-Christian life in Rome might lead you to believe that the catacombs were underground lairs in which early followers of Jesus would meet in secret. This was the only option they had to practice their faith and avoid persecution by imperial authorities. While early Christian communities did face harassment and even martyrdom at the hands of the Romans, the catacombs only had one function, the burial of the dead. And they were not secrets either. In fact, Romans were sticklers for well-run bureaucracy and record-keeping so ancient registry officers kept accurate plans. There are 60 catacomb networks in Rome, although only five of them are currently open to the public. And We'll get to them later. The concept of the underground sepulchre was not an original Christian idea. While Romans preferred to cremate their dead, some families did bury their loved ones in sarcophagi placed in subterranean galleries. This was a custom inherited from the Etruscans, Rome's nearby foe turned ally, who had a home in modern day Tuscany. These pagan burial sites were the exceptions rather than the norm. In the early imperial period, catacombs were more widespread amongst Jewish communities. Unlike pagans, Jews believed in preserving preserving the integrity of the body as a means to facilitate passage to the afterlife. Therefore, a Jewish burial site needed far more land than a pagan one. The laws of the time forbade citizens from burying their relatives within the city walls, meaning even burial grounds outside the perimeter of Rome came at a high price. Therefore, Jewish communities resorted to digging below ground level to accommodate their dead. Early Christians derived many of their practices straight from Judaism, and funerary rites were no exception. As Christianity began to take hold in Rome, worshippers began to take over existing catacombs, even as they were digging new ones. In some cases, Christians would inherit land from sympathetic patrician families, resulting in the expansion of pre-existing pagan cemeteries. The catacombs of Domitia are one such example, as we'll see later. Structurally, a typical catacomb would span about 10 to 15 kilometers, that's 6 to 9 miles, of underground galleries laid over four levels and reaching a depth of about 20 meters, that's 66 feet. The walls of these galleries were lined with hundreds of burial recesses or lacule, the most common kind of tomb. Each recess normally housed one single body, without a casket or sarcophagus. Bodies were simply wrapped in a shroud and covered in lime to slow down the normal process of decay. The recess was then closed with marble slates or tiles, on which the family of the deceased placed inscriptions in Greek or Latin. An alternative to the inscription was to place a small object by the tomb, which indicated the profession of its occupants. In the case of children, grieving parents would simply place the toy as a memento. If the deceased belonged to a wealthier family, they could be placed inside larger niches, sized as small rooms. These were known as cubicula or bedchambers, and they were also used to lay the remains of martyrs. On the high end of the burial spectrum, you would find the arcacilia. These were large, arched recesses richly decorated with wall paintings of religious subjects. 
Early catacombs in the second half of the third century AD usually developed in a spontaneous fashion, without planning or supervision. As they grew in size, religious authorities stepped in to ensure that they were properly managed. A professional figure emerged, that of the Fasors, who were part gravediggers, part administrators, and part brokers of burial recesses. They began selling a kulai space to the families of the deceased. These guys were professional, but that doesn't mean they were necessarily honest. For example, they were rarely above accepting bribes if, say, a wealthy patron wanted to gain access to a lacunas in a prime spot or near the cubiculum of a famous martyr. The Fasors would take note of how often a burial was visited by the relatives of the dead. If visits waned and then ceased altogether, they would then sell the same occupied spot to another family. This explains why many of the lacunae contain more than one body. This is not the only example of foul play taking place in the Roman underground. After decades of persecution against Christians, Emperor Constantine allowed freedom of worship in 313 AD with the Edict of Milan. As Christianity gained in popularity, so did the cult of the early saints and martyrs. Many overeager believers then flocked to the catacombs in search of relics tied to these holy precursors. And if they could not immediately find the sacred bones of Saint Tibia, the confessor, or blessed phalanges of Antioch, then they would just smash the slates, protecting the loculi, and pillage whatever remains were available. With the decline and fall of Rome in the 5th century AD, catacombs had to contend with more attacks from vandals, and by this I mean actual vandals and other barbarian populations. This time, the smash-and-grab frenzy was motivated by the search for jewelry that may have been buried with the owners. By this time, the catacombs had fallen into disuse and disrepair in favor of the more traditional cemeteries. The popes decided to move most of the holy relics into churches and ordered for the entrances to be concealed so as to prevent further looting. Thus, with one single exception, the catacombs of St. Sebastian, these paleo-Christian necropolises, were largely forgotten. Interest in these forgotten burial grounds was resurrected on May 31, 1578, when an underground cemetery was accidentally discovered by a crew of road maintenance workers. A serious and methodical exploration of this subterranean network took place only from the year 1596, when an 18-year-old law student, Antonio Bossio, decided to quit his studies and research the Roman catacombs. Bossio's successes were not as rigorous, though, and most explorers of the Roman tunnels were more interested in raiding the loculi in search of relics or less spiritual loot. The next great archaeologist to study the catacombs was Giovanni Battista de Rossi, one of the founders of modern Christian archaeology. De Rossi started young. After reading Bossio's book on the catacombs, he took to exploring them from the age of 19, with his younger brother in tow as an assistant and cartographer. It's thanks to the work of Bossio, de Rossi, and their successors that we can study, visit, and enjoy at least just a fraction of the Christian catacombs today. Now, just before we continue with today's video, let me quickly thank today's fantastic sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming website that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Now, if you're enjoying this video, then why not try out Curiosity Stream for free and check out their docuseries, The Story of Europe, which is a six-part docuseries that dives into some of Europe's most interesting history. If you're enjoying this one, very much about European history, then I think you will definitely enjoy that as well. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms, web app, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TV. Look, if you've got a screen that was made in the last few years, it's going to be able to run Curiosity Stream almost certainly. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for you guys, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up through the link below and use the promo code GEOGRAPHICS during the sign up process. That's a great way to support the show, keeps us making more videos, and well, it's just a great fit for sponsorship because, you know, we sort of make little videos about educational stuff, curiosity stream, make full on documentaries. So look, if you like this, you'll like them and let's get back to it. A whole lifetime is not nearly enough to explore in detail the city of Rome, but with good planning, it could be possible to visit all five catacombs in a couple of days. A good place to start are the catacombs of Calixtus on the ancient Appian Way just south of the city centre. They originated in the middle of the 2nd century AD, in time occupying an area of 36 hectares, that's 89 acres. The complex unravels across 19 kilometres of galleries, 12 miles, arranged over four levels, which span more than 20 metres underground. The burial site 
developed quite randomly at the beginning until Pope Zephyrinus tasked Deacon Calixtus with reorganizing and administering the cemetery. In time, these catacombs became the favorite resting place for the elite of the Roman Church. The remains of 13 bishops and 16 popes can be found here. Ironically, Mr. Calixtus may not have been worthy of resting alongside such saintly remains. According to ancient author Hippolytus, Calixtus reached his episcopal position through fraud and guile. Calixtus also held administrative posts for imperial authorities, but was at a certain point exiled to a mine in Sardinia on embezzlement charges. These catacombs are also known as Little Vatican because of the high presence of bishops and popes, but they also bear the mark of what happens when emperors such as Decius or Valerian decided to crack down on Christians. I should stress again that early Christians did not use catacombs as hiding places, but it could be that Roman authorities raided them in order to apprehend worshippers while they were praying for their daily departed. This is why there are signs that two of the main stairways were blocked, functionally replaced by narrow secret passages connected to a nearby sand pit. These catacombs are notable for the crypts of Saint Cecilia, or one of the most most popular early saints, patron of music and musicians, and legendary inventor of the organ, martyred in the 3rd century AD, she was reputed to sing so sweetly that the angels descended to listen to her voice. Not far from the area of Calixtus, again along the Appian Way, lay the catacombs of Saint Sebastian. In the early Middle Ages, all records and memories of the catacombs had been forgotten, except for these. But there are other features that make them special. These are the catacombs which give the name of catacombs to catacombs. In ancient records, these were known as Cemeterium ad Catacumbas, or the cemetery by the hollows. The word catacumbas became attached to any system of subterranean sepulchre, and that is why I call them catacombs. Of course, I've not just included St. Sebastian's complex in this list to prove a point. These catacombs have the distinction of having hosted the bodies of St. Peter and St. Paul. According to the early stories of the saints, Peter and Paul had been discarded into mass graves or even sewers after their martyrdom. Their remains had then been rescued and placed into an underground chamber, which may have been heavily converted from an earlier pagan necropolis. According to one account, Peter and Paul rested here for 40 years. More realistically, they remained in the chamber for less than two years before those pests Christian fanatics claimed their apostles' bodies back. The presence of the two important saints of early Christianity surely contributed to the popularity of these catacombs, and many believers asked to be buried next to them. Even after Saints Paul and Peter had been relocated, the presence of another martyr ensured that the fossors had plenty to do. This was, of course, the titular Saint Sebastian, whose story is worthy of its own episode of our sister channel, Biographics. Around the year 283 AD, Sebastian was a military tribune, commander of the archers of the Praetorian. Guard. As such, he served under Emperor Diocletian, responsible for the last violent persecutions against Christians. A convert Christian himself, Sebastian helped with the burial of four martyrs dubbed the Four Crowned Saints, as they were killed by iron spiked crowns being driven into their skulls. On that occasion, Sebastian was arrested and sentenced to death to be pierced by dozens of arrows shot by his own archers. Miraculously, he survived, but was arrested again and scourged to death on Diocletian's orders in 304 AD. Among other Christian soldiers massacred in that year were martyrs Nereus and Achilles, whose remains rest in the catacombs of Domitia, located some two kilometers northwest of St. Sebastian's. Dating back to 120 AD, this site is one of the most ancient underground cemeteries in Rome, as well as one of the largest. Its galleries are 17 kilometers in length, laid over four underground stories, and contain some 15,000 bodies. This area was property of Flavius Clemens and his wife Flavia Domitia, great niece of Emperor Domitian. As Flavius expressed sympathy towards early Christians, the couple were forced into exile. Before leaving Rome, Domitia gifted the land to the Christian community so that they could bury their dead. Domitia's catacombs are also the only ones to boast a large underground church open to visitors. In fact, between the years 366 and 399 AD, Popes Damascus and Sericius ordered for an underground basilica to be built in successive stages around the tombs of the soldiers and martyrs Nereus and Achilles. The church also encompassed the tomb of St. Petronia, which, according to a disputed tradition, was the daughter of St. Peter. 
The catacombs of Domitia contained the remains of several patrician members of the Flavian family, which prompted early researchers to speculate that Christianity was widespread amongst Roman elites as early as the second century. Actually, most of these aristocratic graves belong to a pre-existing burial site, the Hypogeum of the Gens Flavia. This was effectively the private underground cemetery of the Flavian family. To visit a sepulcher with legit Christian Roman aristocracy, one must visit the catacombs of St. Agnes, just north of central Rome in the Trieste district. Agnes was the 13-year-old daughter of patrician parents during the reign of Emperor Valerian from 253 to 260 AD. Agnes was sought in marriage by the son of a prefect, but she refused, claiming that she was already wedded to Jesus Christ. In other words, she had made a vow of chastity. Plus, she was 13, so she should have probably been left alone. Agnes was then arrested as a Christian and sentenced to be burned. As she emerged unscathed from the flames, the henchmen of the emperor had her publicly beheaded. Some 60 years later, Emperor Constantine issued the Edict of Milan in February of 313 AD. This permanently decreed freedom of worship for Christians in the empire. Due to her aristocratic origins, Agnes became a popular saint among many noble Roman families, and this catacomb became the fashionable cemetery of the elite during the 4th century. Even Constantine's daughter, Constantia, Helena, and Constantina asked to be buried near Agnes. The last stop in our catter hopping tour are the catacombs of Priscilla in the same Trieste district. The galleries of these catacombs extend along 13 kilometers and are dug into tuff. Despite its name, the volcanic rock is soft and easy to excavate. This site is renowned for two features. First, the so-called Greek Chapel. This is an underground chamber decorated with stuccos, frescoes in the Pompeian style, and Greek inscriptions, hence the name. Beside the normal niches to accommodate sarcophagi and shrouded bodies, the chamber also has a long seat for funeral banquets traditionally held at the catacombs to honor the dead. This tradition is referenced by a wall painting within the central arch of the chapel, which depicts a banquet with seven people. One of them is parting the bread, a clear reference to the Last Supper, and the rite of the Eucharist. The second main feature of Priscilla's catacomb is another painting found within another gallery. In the image, a young woman holds an infant on her knee. The man stands next to her, holding a scroll in his left hand and pointing to a star with his right. The scroll and the star have been interpreted as attributes of the man being a prophet. The star may be a reference to the prophecy of Balaam from the biblical book of Numbers. It reads, A star shall rise out of Jacob, a scepter shall spring up from Israel. The child, therefore, may be Jesus and the woman his mother. If this interpretation is correct, that would make the painting the oldest image of the Virgin Mary in existence. The portrait of Mary inside Priscilla's catacombs is but one of the many examples of fine arts that can be found 20 meters below street level in Rome. The most common form of iconography in the catacombs are the early Christian symbols. Even when crudely carved on stone or marble, these are able to convey a precise and complex spiritual idea while remaining obscure to the persecuting Roman authorities. Probably the most widespread symbol was the monogram of Christ, formed by interlacing the chi and rho letters of the Greek alphabet. These are also the first two letters of the word Christos or Christ. The monogram was carved on nearly all tombstones to indicate that a Christian was buried there. Another recurring symbol devised to baffle hostile pagans was the fish, which works on two levels. On one level, this image recalls the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fish. By extension, this alludes to the Eucharist meal or Last Supper. On another level, the fish is a cryptogram. The Greek word for it, ichtos, is an acrostic for Lessus Christus Theoisota, or in English, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Saviour. Other symbols which may have been conceived to baffle enemies of Christianity were the anchor, the phoenix, and the alpha and omega. The anchor is a symbol of salvation for the soul which has finally reached the port of eternity. The phoenix, the bird who rises from its ashes, is clearly a symbol of the resurrection of the flesh. While alpha and omega, the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, signify that Christ is the beginning and end of all things. The underground paintings of the catacombs offer a fascinating insight into the evolutionary arc of early Christian society, early Christian art, and late Roman art in general. The symbols that we've described here are crude in style and esoteric in meaning. This may be reflective of early Christians belonging to the poorer and less educated strata of society. It also points to the small and secretive nature of these early communities who resorted to these symbols as a means to identify and recognize themselves. In later years, early Christians grew in numbers and in prestige.
More and more military officers, patricians, and landowners joined their ranks as members of society who could afford professional artists. This is reflected in the artwork, embracing a more refined style, progressing from carvings to colorful wall paintings or even mosaics. At the same time, the subjects depicted are more openly and defiantly Christian in nature. In the 3rd and 4th century AD, the most common painted motives included the Good Shepherd and the Lamb, representing Christ and the soul which he has saved, respectively, or the Arunti, praying figures with their open arms raised towards heaven. Christian artists became adept at reproducing passages from the Old and New Testament, usually seen symbolizing resurrection. For example, the story of the prophet Jonas, who escaped from the belly of a monstrous fish, or that of Lazarus, raised from the dead by Jesus. Other popular characters are the three kings, or wise men from the east. As the first to have adored the baby Jesus, these kings were considered to be the first pagans to convert to Christianity, and therefore were considered as illustrious predecessors by early Christian Romans. The three kings are almost always depicted next to the Virgin Mary, sitting on a throne with Jesus on her lap. After the Edict of Milan, the catacombs progressively ceased to be used as burial sites. Therefore, production of new artwork became less and less frequent in the 4th and 5th centuries. The only new wall paintings to be completed were those adorning graves of the martyrs, still a popular destination for pilgrims. Painters adorned these capicula with images of the early saints, usually surrounding Christ. Later artwork of the 5th century is poorer in quality compared to that of the 3rd and early 4th centuries. The technique of the painters appears to have impoverished. Human figures appear stiffer and clumsier than before, the images less detailed. Christianity had become the foremost religion of Rome by then, and the Western Roman Empire steadily declined, and so did its art and society. Meanwhile, the cult of the saints and martyrs, the celebrations for the dead, moved upstairs. Gradually, the ancient catacombs were sealed off and forgotten for centuries. One of the many lairs of the Eternal City shut off from the march of time for more than a thousand years, lying in wait to be rediscovered. The word martyr indicates a victim of violent religious or political persecution, but its original meaning in Greek is witness. And so the catacombs re-emerged from the darkness to pay witness to a distant era. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos a couple of times a week. Also, please do check out our fine sponsor, CuriosityStream. There is a link to them below. And thank you for watching.